fishing. I learned this lesson over this last weekend, okay? So yesterday, I've got this fishing pole, and I stink at fishing. I'm absolutely terrible. I'll tell you the truth. And fishing is all about uncertainty. I, I mean, you have no idea where the fish are. You have no idea what the fish are eating. You have no idea how deep in the water the fish are swimming. You have no idea where you should stand, how long you should cast any of this stuff. It's just fraught with uncertainty. I sometimes wonder why people are interested in it at all. Because it's just so uncertain. So you, you grab this one piece of bait and you stab it onto your hook and, and wrap it around and get it all on there so it's not going to fly off. And you cast and you wait. And you watch the little bobber. And then you yank and get nothing. So you do it again. And so this is my experience. There's some guys on this uh, trip. Over the course of the weekend, we believe, we believe we caught somewhere in the level of like 35 fish uh, among the six of us who were there. And I contributed three. So... I got my good 10% in there. But anyway, so it's uncertain. Everything about fishing is uncertain, uncertain, uncertain. You don't have any idea what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, the fish bites. You get a bite, you catch the fish on the end of your string, and then uncertainty just goes out the window. I have a pole, I have a string, I have a hook in the fish's mouth, and if I keep that fish for a few seconds, nine times out of ten, nine times out of nine, it's almost a certainty, almost a done deal, that fish is going to end up in my basket, if it's big enough. But at the very least, it's going to end up in my hand. Certainty, okay? I instantaneously have perfect and total control. There's this one time where I, I caught a fish yesterday, and I'm reeling it in, and I'm just watching it swim around at the end of my string. And it's just swimming around. And then a bass came up behind it. And so I'm watching the bass chase my fish, and I'm just kind of playing with it, wash, flying it like a kite in water. Um, because I knew I could wait. I knew I could be patient, and I could eventually reel the thing in, because it's on the end of my string. It's a done deal. Uncertainty is out the window. And I got to tell you this, that sometimes religion is like fishing. There's a lot of uncertainty. There are a lot of questions that we have. There are a lot of things that we don't exactly get about life. And so religion can, comes in, can come in, and it can be that thing that gives control and stability and certainty. And, and honestly, there are some people who have abused it to make it so. Some people have used religion like a string on the end of a fishing pole. And once you get hooked, you're under their control. And they will move you, and they will watch you, and if you get out of line, they'll reel you in a little bit more, and they'll tug on you. And they use religion as a manipulative power play, a manipulative tactic to gain control over you. I mean, on one hand, it kind of is biblical. Jesus said to his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. But he never intended for that statement to mean, I will make you get people on the end of your rope and you will drag them wherever you want them to go. That is absolutely the farthest thing from Jesus' mind. Someday we should be able to get an opportunity to talk about what Jesus meant by that whole statement of you will be fishers of people. But it did not in any way mean you're going to rope people up and drag them where you want them to go. That was the farthest thing from Jesus' mind. In fact, religion as we see it when it is controlling people like that is abusive, wrong, and completely outside of God's will. So we're going to look at this aspect of religion. We're going to look at a church that Jesus writes a letter to and what he has to say to them about this abuse of power thing that's going on. And so, before we dig into all that, I want to ask you to pray with me. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, I ask this morning that you would guide the words that I speak, guard the thoughts that are in our hearts, and make everything pure and holy and acceptable to you. You're our rock, you're our redeemer, our savior, our king, and we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me invite you to pull out your note sheet for this week and get ready to fill out some blanks. A little bit of review. We're in a series that I've called Losing My Religion. We are talking about moving beyond religious stuff into a relationship with Jesus. And to remind you kind of of the definition we've been using, religion is a reliance on rituals and doctrines in order to achieve spiritual gain. But Christianity is about a relationship of God trying to get closer to us. God trying to overcome the sin barrier that we've put in place. 
and he wants to draw near us. And so here's a few of the things we've covered already. I printed them on your sheet. You can see them there. Uh, Number two, we don't have time for religious games because our king is coming soon. Number three, religion is heartless, but following Jesus means loving God and others. Number four, religion is easy. It's just a list of do's and don'ts. You can write them down and check them off. But following Jesus takes tough endurance. Number five, religion is deceptive, but following Jesus means faithfulness to the truth. And today, you can tell by the title, we're talking about this truth, that religion is power. Religion is power. Uh, Stephen Covey, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, writes that there are four basic human needs that everybody has. And that's how religion gains power. I'm just going to show these to you, put them on the screen, you can jot them down. These are the four basic human needs, to live, to love, to learn, and to leave a legacy. This weekend we were fishing, we're having a good time, and Brandon offered to uh, start a commune that would be just a fishing commune. Just a bunch of us guys would just not come home. And, uh, you know, we had the fish, we could catch the fish, we could just eat what we caught, we could just live there in that house, far away from everybody. We might call our, our wives and have them come down, maybe the children, and just have ourselves, have ourselves a little religious commune, do our own little church services on Sunday morning, and just, you know, live that out, just, just communing. And, you know, that meets a lot of those needs. We can live, okay? We've got food. We can handle it. We can love. We build relationships, bring our wives down, maybe the kids. We can learn. We can learn how to fish. We can learn about each other. We can maybe even study the Bible together. We can even leave a legacy. If we do bring our children down there, we can train them to be all attached to this commune kind of thing too. And I just thought, well, you know, Brandon, there are a bunch of people back in Lafayette that I kind of like sometimes too. So maybe this commune thing doesn't work. I decided maybe I'll just come home. Um, But this is the deal. Religion often works this way because it offers us these kinds of things. You have the question of what's going to happen to me after I die. Religion will answer that question for you. They will tell you you're going to live here, here, or in some fashion. Uh, You might have the question of love. You know, who's going to love me? Religion answers that. If there's no God that loves you in the particular religion that's at question, then certainly there are people in that religion who, if you join it, they're going to love you. Kind of like a gang or a cult kind of situation. You have that communal sort of relationship, a, a love kind of relationship. Uh, you're going to learn something. There's always secret knowledge in every type of religious group that you can get. And you're going to be able to leave a legacy because, you know, maybe you're at the cutting edge of whatever this particular religion thing sort of is. See, if someone offers you all four of these things, you're likely to say, yes, Mr. Osama, I will fly that plane. Because he is offering you everything. And see, that's where religion and power...